Well, good morning and welcome to the 25th meeting of the Economy, Energy and Fair Work Committee for 2018. May I ask everyone present to turn off or turn to silent any electrical devices, please. We've received apologies for this morning's meeting from uh, committee members Angela Constance, Dean Lockhart and Andy Whiteman. Uh, item one on the agenda is a decision by the committee to take items five and six in private. Are we agreed? Yes. Thank you. Now we turn to draft budget scrutiny for the 2019 to 20 year. And uh, we have with us today uh, a number of witnesses. First of all, Helen Martin, who is Assistant General Secretary of the Scottish Trades Union Congress. Rob Gowans, who is Policy Officer of Citizens Advice Scotland. Um, Gordon McGuinness, who is the Director of Industry and Enterprise for Skills Development Scotland. And last but not least, Matt Lancashire, who is the Director of Policy and Public Affairs for the Scottish Council for Development and Industry. So welcome to all four of you this morning. And uh, without further ado, I will turn to John Mason to start questions for our panel this morning. Uh, thanks very much, uh, convener. So to start off uh, focusing on employment support services, as I understand it, the budget has been somewhat reduced from what it was in past years when all of this was controlled by Westminster. And so I suppose my first question is, do you think the budget is sufficient for what we're trying to do? Uh, I think we understand First Start Scotland is targeting 38,000 people. Um, are there more people out there that need support? Um, how is that all going to work on the financial side, do you think? Um, who would like to start off there? The um, actual sound system will operate, be operated by the broadcasting desk, so no need to operate any bu buttons if... I think you've all been here before, if you just indicate. Uh, Gordon McGuinness. Uh, I'll start. Uh, I think you're right in, in relation to the, the budget that has been a reduction. It's still somewhere in the region of £96 million pounds for that. Uh, and I think government are obviously confident, having went to procurement, that they can deliver that, that service within the, the programme. I think you have to probably look at it in its entirety across the actual employability skills pipeline that the government have. So there's five stages in that. So it's not just that £96 million pounds that plays into that space. And we've got employability fund, uh, which we deliver on behalf of government. And then you have significant contributions from local authorities uh, as well which are non-statutory services, but will differ from location to location, depending on, I guess, the Council's ambitions to address uh, unemployment. And I think the other issue to recognise is that unemployment levels have fallen, and I think it's probably wrong to make a comparison year on year when the nature of unemployment is changing. I think the Government have put a strong focus on helping those with disabilities and those with protected characteristics, and I think that's to be, be welcomed. It's early days, I think, in the launch of the, the new programme, so I guess time will tell, and I think the important thing is to have good monitoring arrangements and good uh, publication of, of data and the quality of the service as well. So it sounds like you're not, you're not too concerned about the actual budget? I, I think time, time will tell. It's, it's, it's early, it's a, a voluntary uh, programme, obviously, so there's not that kind of push through the system, you know, people being... Uh, uh, kind of compulsory nature to do it, so I think we probably just need to keep alert and, as I said, have good management information to guide the system and, and also think around the range of clients that are entering the, the, the programme. But as I said, the employability pipeline is, is quite broad and there's a, a range of initiatives and measures that come into that, and not just the, the new programme. Mr Lancashire. Uh, it's probably just to echo some of Gordon's points that the 96 million sh shouldn't be seen, I suppose, in isolation, considering the, the, the total spend on employability in skills in Scotland, which I forget the name of the report, but it was in the hundreds and hundreds of millions. So uh, how does that reflect? How do we connect these services together to, to maybe reduce duplication and look to kind of single outcomes that support both social employability, housing, and all these different areas that employability and skills kind of touch on to support an individual through. I think the other aspect on, on, on the budget of the 96 million that's quite interesting though is, is the quality of service provided. And I, and I think that is too early to tell right now from, from First Star Scotland. But 
if you reduce effectively reduce the money, you effectively reduce the money that's going to the service providers themselves and, and, and what type of service they, they can potentially offer as well. So that might be a point to focus on when we get more data from the service providers about their outcomes, about how many people are passing through the service itself and how many people have actually got six months employment uh, at the end of that too. So it's a bit too early to tell, but a reduction in budget, the pressure goes on the service provider to do something more efficient, something more different to, to enable enable that service to be delivered. Mm. <coughs> Ms Martin? Yeah, I think I think just on that point, um, I think we would maybe be a bit more concerned about the reduction in the budget. I think, um, I think we do recognise that the labour market is quite tight at the minute, and in some ways that creates both um, sort of a positive environment, but it also creates a challenge because the employability services are now really looking to place people who are quite difficult to to place and who historically have quite a lot of barriers getting into employment. So for us, you know, we would want to see really good outcomes for disabled workers at, at this time because, you know, if the labour market is, if there is such a low level of unemployment, there is no reason why there should be such a large employment gap for disabled workers. And I think um, that that sort of support requires more budget rather than less. Um, and I think it, it, it does potentially create challenges, I think, for the providers in the way that Matt was just describing, um, because, uh, y you know, that they, they are having to potentially deal with more complex things that would need to be more innovative, and it is difficult to do that when your budget is falling. I mean, are you happy with the actual the, the kind of model? Because it seems to me, reading some of the papers, there's an assumption that if we just put a few things in place, a, any disabled person can do any job, almost. I mean, that, I'm slightly overstating it. A, where, whereas, but some people, you know, just face huge hurdles and, and will not be able to work, say, a 35-hour week or even a 16-hour week. Do, do you think the system is, is um, well, there is enough money there primarily to support... Um, I think there's quite a lot of issues about how the system works and how the system counts success. Um, we would like to see a slightly more uh, person-centred approach that takes more cognizance of um, the sort of uh, of what a successful outcome for disabled workers might look like. Um, we also think that there's way too much emphasis, though, on preparing the person for 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 work rather than pre preparing the work for the per for the person. So um, we. You know, our Disabled Workers Committee would constantly say that there should be more emphasis on ensuring employers understand their obligations and employers are ready to provide the kind of support that's needed to support a disabled person into the workplace rather than helping a disabled worker work on their CV or work on their interview techniques. I mean, there's just that it's too one sided, the system, and that, you know, quality of work and support for the employer needs to be a bigger emphasis within that within that system as well. Okay, thanks. Well, I think one of my colleagues will go on to outcomes later, so I'll probably come back to that, so that's fine. Mr Gowns, did you want to say anything at this stage? Or? Um, we don't have a great deal to add. Other organisations will be in a, a better place to say um, whether the budget um, whether the budget is sufficient or not in terms of providing the employment services. I um, would certainly echo the points about um, the importance of the system being um, joined up well with other things. Fair Start Scotland's not the... Um, certainly not the only employment employment programme provided by um, by third sector by public sector in Scotland, and I think that it um, to make sure that they they complement each other well, and echo some of the points on on sort of measuring success. I think there's um, um, well sort of uh, yes, we should measure sustained job outcomes, but there's also sort of uh, I think sort of softer outcomes um, that it's important to. Um, to capture as well, given that um, and the people who um, involved with the um, with the program are quite far from the labour market, so just a, a sort of a, a getting people into um, into work or not. I think there's there's other um, there's other measurements that that sort of could be could be used in terms of determining success. I mean, the other area I wanted to touch on was the whole question that this is going to be a voluntary program rather than in the past it was allegedly con compulsory and there was potential of sanctions which there appear not to be now. Are you all comfortable with that kind of new approach? Yes. I mean, yeah, I, yeah, I think there's... The, I cannot speak for SCI. Our, our members are, are comfortable with that approach and, and, and support it. Um, I think what's revealing from the, the interim programmes uh, Work First and Work Able is that whilst there was a voluntary nature, the, the 
there was only 60% of people that volunteered to go on to, I think it was work first, that actually took up the programme itself. So 40% of people before they even got to going through <coughs> a service provider's door are dropped out of the programme entirely. So th there's there's an issue there. And whether that maybe that they found work, excellent, fantastic, that's great news, that's what we want. That could be one of the reasons, whether it's a change in circumstance, I, I, I don't know. But I think the more investigation needs to be done of that slip off rate from those 100% that volunteer but only 60% start the program where's the other 40% gone is it they found a job is it they're doing something else or is it they've not been engaged by the service provider or or, or the services on offer and that's where I think a bit of focus needs to be be, be put on Mr McGuess <coughs> I think that kind of issue there relates to people getting sufficient information I think to make informed decisions about what direction they're actually going to, going to go in. Uh, I always think when we're talking around that journey back from, say, welfare back into work, we need to understand where people are coming from. So they're coming from perhaps not a very uh, lucrative financial position, but it is regular and it is guaranteed with uh, lots of employment now being kind of non-standard type employment. And I think people need to make an informed decision in terms of when they move towards the labour market, what that means for their own financial security. And I think that plays out in some of the slip-off in terms of uh, referrals to the, to the programme. Right, thanks very much. Yes, <clears throat> just, just picking up on, on one of the points there, um, talking about a sustained job outcome, for example, is, is that um, the best way to look at it or... I think, Helen Martin, you touched on the, some of the issues surrounding this, getting people back into work. So someone that uh, one person might be able to go into a particular job from having no job to a job where they work 30 hours a week. For someone else, it might not be possible to, to do that sort of level of commitment initially. Say perhaps 10 hours may depend on the person, may depend on the job. Um, so is it, is it better to look at it as being something where progress can be made incrementally? step by step, depending on the individual, depending on the job, um, or, or how, how should we approach this? <laughs> it's, a, it's actually a, a, a pretty difficult question, I think, in, in real terms, um, because I think there, there is an issue with um, some workers finding it challenging to go straight into a 16-hour a week role, particularly if they've got long-term disabilities, if they've got health problems. You know, that can be quite difficult to do but at the same time we don't want to create a situation where any level of our contract is okay and is considered a successful outcome for any worker because we are seeing more and more instances in the labour market of very very short hour contracts being offered and I do think we need to consider how it is that people keep themselves in a financially stable position and how it is that people keep themselves out of poverty and we can't have a situation where employability services are driving people into really low wage low hour jobs that leave them in poverty and leave them in a worse position than before because because that can't be a successful outcome either. So I think there is a real tension here about how, how it is that you design a system that has statistical outcomes that look effective. Um, in some ways, we would be tempted to urge caution about driving everything from a targeted approach for these sorts of reasons and instead looking at what actually is a good outcome for that worker and make it person-centred and make and give a bit of professionalism into the system so that if the employability service is saying that it's successful then in some ways and the worker themselves is saying that it's successful for them that in some ways that that can be the measure of success rather than um, necessarily setting statistical targets at the, at the centre and, and, and applying those rigidly to every single, in every single case. I mean, I wonder if it might be partly to do with um, progress can be gradual in many things in life and um, rather than thinking about the question of you know, people being told to do you know, contracts with low hours, but as you say, a person-centred approach, but people can build up uh, rather than sort of going from no work into, a, say, a 30-hour a week. Um, I mean, is that, is that what we're talking about? Or? Um, I think that could be a successful outcome for some workers, but I, I also worry about the idea that actually that building up of ours can be very 
can actually be very very difficult to do you know we um we have worker we have unions represented in the retail sector for example who have a lot of members who would love to work more hours and they, they can't get longer hour contracts and that is affecting their living standards that is that is affecting their ability to you know stay out of debt and that is for people who are already in work so we have to be careful that our employability service doesn't sort of drive those sorts of outcomes and i think with the changes that we've seen in the labor market um, and the rise of the kind of gig economy, there are now a lot of options that allow you to do very, very small number of hours of work in lots of really interesting ways, but it doesn't necessarily mean that people have a sustainable job outcome that keeps them out of poverty. And I think that understanding of whether or not people are, get, are, 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 are better or worse financially off for going into the labour market is, is kind of an important one. And I would like to live in a world where people were able to sort of do things that, that allowed them to go into work gradually and to build it up and to have that sort of dignity that comes with work. And I think that would be really, that would be really positive, but it, it does need, there needs to be some give in the system. And there also needs to be opportunities that are more sustainable, available to the people. And I, I just I worry about the fact that those opportunities, particularly at the low end of the labour market, the low skilled end, are being closed down. Well, that, that's what I was wondering, because if there is an opportunity to progress, to increase hours, increase work, or develop um, a job or a worker's skills, um, then that's different than obviously going in at a certain level and just getting stuck there, so to speak. But it may be starting there and then progressing is, is the answer, rather than viewing what happens immediately as the outcome, taking a more long-term view of it, which may take a bit longer, but may ultimately be more successful. Can I just add to that? Um, I think we need to escape the tag of disability as well because one disabled person's decisions to another can be very different and a lot of people present on these programmes with alcohol issues, with housing problems, with domestic abuse going on in the family. And you're right, Gordon, that that progression is very different for someone who is just disabled and doesn't suffer all these other things that happen in the background too. So. A measure of progression is health and well-being within the within the process itself. How do you create the contracts to be able to say, right, we've got someone in, who's got a disability, but all these other issues going on as well. That's going to take a lot longer to get into work than someone that doesn't have these other issues that attach to them to provide that employment with. I think in terms of the job outcomes, I think we need to escape that every disabled person is going into a zero-hour contract in some kind of Death Star kind of approach of a business because we are trying to drive responsible businesses in Scotland. It's a key part of what we're trying to channel as a society and as a nation. And whilst I'm not saying that might not happen in some circumstances, most of the service providers, certainly the SCDI and, and some members of ours, have come across very much trying to champion quality jobs and, and quality uh, living standards within those and quality pay. I think the other aspects of that, what keeps someone in a job is the ability to progress and that progression is, is key. So you walk into a job, what are the skills needed for automation, AI in the future? How do we provide those in, in the place of someone's career through work-based learning once someone's in post and past that six months? So I think we need just to escape that fact that every person that cut churned out of this programme walks into a terrible job in terrible conditions, because that's, that's certainly not the case. Um, Rob Goins. Um, yeah, I think it was um, just to echo the point that, um, that fair work's particularly important. Um, we know from research that a, um, a sort of bad job can, in some cases, be even worse for, for somebody's general health and mental health than, um, than being unemployed. Um, at the same time, I think that we would um, we would support uh, um, outcomes being measured on an individual basis. What works for some people doesn't work for others. What's what might be appropriate if a short hours contract's appropriate for some people, it won't be in in some cases. And particularly if if people are um, are essentially relying on it as their as their main source of um, source of income. So I think these are sort of some of the things that. I think sort of be built into the the kind of measuring measuring the success of the program alongside um, sustained job outcomes. Uh, Gordon McInnes. Uh, I think I would just add that uh, probably understanding the working relationship between universal credit and as the person progresses into it, I think it was 
hailed initially is that was going to provide the kind of safety net for, for people who were entering back into the labour market, particularly in shorter term jobs, and that could be scaled as their ability to work and earn increased. Uh, so I'm not an expert in it, but I think we should probably examine just how effective that is being as it's rolled out and how effective the agencies are working in, in behind the system. So uh, we were having a chat earlier around just the exchange of earnings rates and that type of thing. Can that be done in a more automated way that, that you know doesn't put the individual at an inconvenience every time a cheque's got to be got to be made. So uh, examining how universal credit operates in Scotland I think would be, be worthwhile. Thank you. Now Jackie Bailey. Um, that needs, leads me on neatly to exploring something that I think Matt um, responded to, which is round about um, guaranteeing fair work. And I was very pleased to hear him say what some of the employers, certainly within the SCDI family, um, do. But I'm wondering across all the programmes, Modern Apprenticeships, Employability Fund, Fair Start Scotland, um, do we check? Is it a general exhortation? Um, is the grant given to the providers conditional? on them securing a job that actually guarantees fair work. How do we do this? Or is it just through encouragement? I mean, I'll, I'll Gordon. Uh, pick up. Uh, in terms of fair work, I think if I look at the modern apprenticeship programme, Scotland has maintained a very high policy line on this. It must be full-time employment, and it must be offer quality, quality training. Uh, where we are in terms of legislation is that we're tied to the the UK government's minimum wages, uh, rather than being able to uh, insist on a, a living wage condition, and, and that would be a call for government to make to if they were going to apply that level of conditionality. I would caution moving to that, and, and some of the programmes and offers that are, are there just now from government, for example, the kind of commitment in early years. In childcare, the provision that's been funded through government, I think there's a, a condition that a living wage has got to be, Scottish living wage has got to be paid. But for other sectors, and I'm thinking of hospitality and, and some of the food and drink sectors, it would probably reduce significantly the number of opportunities that were made available for apprenticeships. So there's a, a balance to be struck there. But I think in England we've seen apprenticeships that will last 12 weeks and the young person or adults back out in the street after 12 weeks, that simply doesn't happen in Scotland. We've got a far better quality criteria, and the providers and our own staff, in terms of monitoring, analyse this uh, and make sure, and some of the papers refer to you know, rotating doors. I'm pretty confident that we don't, don't have that, and by and large, the evaluation activity that would take place, both with individuals and with customers, would point to the kind of quality of the experience and the learning that they've got. So I think my sticking point is probably around where you would say a, a minimum wage for, for apprenticeship programmes. It does make me slightly nervous that we seem to be um, underlining poverty pay in certain sectors, and so I'm, I'm slightly disturbed by the result. I get what you're saying about balance, but nevertheless. Helen, I wonder whether you would come in at this point? <laughs> um, I mean, to be fair to Gordon, some of what he says I would agree with, in that I would agree that the apprenticeship system in Scotland is of better quality than the apprenticeship Scotland in England, and significantly so at this point. Um, and there are definitely some extremely poor outcomes in England in terms of very, very short, poor quality programmes. Um, I think in Scotland we have done well to kind of maintain a, a high level of industry standards, decent qualifications that actually lead to something valuable for the young people. I don't think I agree with the idea that that means that there are no instances at all where you see young people being trained as apprentices and then not receiving a job with that employer at the end of it and the employer going on to train the next young person. I think we do see that at times, particularly, for example, in some construction firms. Um, and I've heard construction industry professionals say that themselves. Um, and I, I think that is something that we kind of need to, to guard against, but it is quite difficult to do it from a from an institutional perspective because, you know, the employer at the end of the day 
um, has to decide whether or not they're going to keep that young person on. But where we can, we need to we need to be encouraging these to be sustainable roles that um, lead to long term stable employment as much as possible for for young people. Um, I do think that there are times when we discuss fair work that we hear fair work being equated to the living wage and not very much else. And um, I think for us we would have a much higher ambition of what fair work actually means in the workplace and about the role that that means for for workers being able to shape their own work and being able to you know um have access to training have a access to 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 um the, the sorts of contracts that they want to work on as well that gives them that gives them a guaranteed income that gives them sort of decent work in the ILO perspective um and I kind of I think that we've gone too far on the on the kind of the living wage is the only way to measure this so much so that we now see employers saying things like oh it's okay I'm a living wage employer and the union says no but two years ago we had union rapes that were agreed about two or three pounds above the living wage and you're now holding yourself up as a living wage employer but that's actually a pay cut for a lot of workers so I think we do need to be careful about unfortunately <laughs> the campaigns that come back to haunt us in in sort of negative ways because they're they're being obscured and they're being used as a badge of honor to, to actually push down on living standards and push down on wages in a in a kind of upsetting way uh, so i was going to come on to later on i suppose mo mo most successful businesses generate great public good jobs prosperity is Cohesive communities and, and as a nation we all we all reap the benefits of that going forward uh, and I think narratives changed around that kind of old command and control type type of business uh, uh, over recent times and many businesses realize the importance I suppose uh, of maintaining trust with customers employees and, and, and wider society not least in a social media driven world um, and I think there's a real need for businesses now that they're beginning to understand their workforce is a key to increasing productivity. Yeah, AI and automation is one way, but actually it's people that really support increasing productivity. And fairness in the workplace only enhances your ability to increase productivity going forward. Um, so the old approach, as I said, around command and control is, is probably starting to ease its way out of businesses in the future. M my question is, how do we encourage more responsible businesses to invest in Scotland, let alone enable the companies that we have here to, to behave in that manner as well. So uh, I think that's another part of this question we need to look at. Agreed. Um, can I take us back to the budget? Because this is part of our budget scrutiny process. Um, we know the figures for Fair Start Scotland. Um, the Employability Fund, how much is in that? Has it gone up? Has it gone down? Gordon. <coughs> Right off the top of my head, I can't give you a figure, but it's, it's holding at the same level as, as this current year. Uh, so uh, it might be useful if you could provide that, us with that, that, that no, information and, and the do. historic one. Yeah. Um, I'm also curious about local authority contributions. I'm guessing they may have gone down, given the tight financial climate that there is. But but again, if you can't tell me, providing us with the information would would be great too. It, it, it will vary. Uh, from local authority to local authority. North Lanarkshire just now uh, put in a kind of concerted effort uh, around a, a growth agenda. And I was in uh, Moffat last week uh, in the south of Scotland agency in Dumfries and Galloway and, and the borders. And Dumfries and Galloway have a very strong uh, chain and access proposition, probably about 55 staff attached to that. And you flip over to the borders, then it's a, a smaller number, but they just delivered that services in different ways. So it does vary from local authority to local authority. How they've used European structural funds in the past will have been a factor as well. And of course, we'll need to start thinking around how those services adapt if, if there's not going to be that, that level of funding there. Some of my colleagues will come on to yeah. explore that in more detail okay. with you. Um, and finally, the apprenticeship levy, because you know people complain it's not transparent. We don't know how money, how much money is there. Could you give us any ideas about that? Uh, well, I think Mr. Hepburn has never uh, hidden his uh, dissatisfaction at, at how the apprenticeship levy has been introduced. And particularly the impact it's had in Scottish public sector as well, who, who also have to pay into it. And I think one kind of figure that all sticks in my mind is there's Glasgow and Clyde Health Board are contributing about £6 million into the 
the levy. So that's a significant, uh, significant amount. So with that public sector input actually in eight effect in terms of what was available for expenditure and through the levy was actually re reduced. And as I said, ministers can probably give a, a, a better uh, version of the detail of that. What Scotland has done is try to maintain a stable system, and we touched on where we see some of the flaws in the English system, and they have flipped and flopped in policy over a number of, of years. And I think the system that they created, the digital account, looks good, but we have had a number of employers in a kind of chase to try and claw back the levy. But if they are then going to hire new staff, then they are also paying more wages, so it's, it's, it's a rather challenging environment for them. Scotland has stuck with a system, I think, which has proven itself. We've expanded to the foundation apprenticeships and graduate level apprenticeships. Again, we've used some European structural funds for that, and we've had good good feedback from it. And that's coming back to a lot of the work that was done through the Wood Report and putting a stronger, much stronger emphasis on work-based learning, as a number of our competitor countries uh, have. So. Uh, the levy, I think, it does frustrate uh, a number of companies in terms of getting access to it. We've created a service where we'll go out and try and uh, maximise what individuals, uh, individual companies can get from the levy in Scotland across the whole skills system, because I think if you look into the health service, then huge amounts of our nurses and social workers train through areas like the colleges, and I appreciate that's not additionality, but I think We've got to appreciate what we're getting back through the contributions that are made into the skills and learning system in its, its totality. Okay. Um, I didn't. I was listening very carefully, but I didn't hear in there a global sum. So I wonder whether you could write to the committee with an indication of the cost. And the other thing I'm interested in is, you know, given that this is a new pot of money coming in, is this all of the money additional, or has it displaced existing training budgets within? either the SDS or the broader government? At a government level, it has displaced the previous funding arrangements for that. In terms of landing on a precise figure, I think the Scottish Government are still working with HMRC to get an attribution across how much is actually you know, paid by Scottish employers for Scottish employees. That has not been an easy thing system-wise, but I will take that back to government colleagues and ask that to be, to be furnished to you. Thank you very much. Um, one final question, convener, and just a very quick one. Um, were any of you involved in actually the design of Fair Start Scotland? Um, and if you were, I'm not getting any engagement, so you probably weren't. If you were, um, what do you think still needs to be changed? Gordon was. Sorry, <laughs> no, SDS. So we assisted government and we contract managed the delivery of the Work Able Scotland and the Work First uh, Scotland programmes through that kind of transitional uh, period. Uh, in, in terms of the detail, I think it's, it's, it's too early for us to be sitting here saying, because I think some of the client groups, some of the people we worked with last year, we've done an interim evaluation uh, with Cambridge Policy Consulting and, and Scottish Government, and certainly there's uh, positive uh, messages back from that kind of 60 per cent, feeling that they were more able to uh, negotiate work in terms of if they had a disability and to declare that disability. So uh, hopefully some of the lessons learned from the systems that uh, were developed and I think the spread of contractors that we have in the new system uh, on that regional basis of so the working in kind of nine regions I think should give a lot of interest and in information back and being able to compare and contrast against what's what's working. Whereas in the past, at a UK level, we tended to have a very big operational area with maybe only two kind of prime contractors. So I think there will be learning that we can get from within the system just now, but the system as it stands is being managed and procured by Scottish Government themselves. Uh, I was going to say, just, just to add to, to Gordon, uh, SDI, SCDI weren't directly in, involved in the design, but certainly a number of its members were through uh, Kirsty and, and um, Employability Support Scotland uh, in terms of the committee that that they ran. Uh, individually, I probably was for a different role uh, uh, back in the day, but um, I, I think there was involvement via the service providers through Employability uh, Scotland. Um, I'm going to sneak in a tiny little question that the convener has allowed me to do. Um, and again, Gordon, I'm afraid you're, you're it. Um, contracts for Fair Start Scotland are three years. I understand contracts for the Employability Fund are one year. Yep. 
Why is there the difference? Um, and do you not think it, promoting stability, whether it's voluntary sector, yeah. private sector, for any training provider, would be a thoroughly good thing to do? I Gordon. think uh, I wouldn't disagree with the sentiment. We operate on a, uh, an annual funding basis, so hence we would deliver contracts on that basis. What we do try to do through the commissioning process is work at a local level with the local authorities and local employability partnerships to get the best fit through the employability fund. I don't think we'll have seen you know, really significant shifts in provision from a year-to-year -year basis, but there's a kind of quality assurance mechanism built into that, that, that process. But obviously, providers in particular, in terms of the kind of business, would look for contracts to be as, as long as they possibly, possibly can. Um, so are you retendering each of those one-year contracts? Is that what we, I'm we, hearing we, we from you? We go through or? a procurement process on an annual basis. Is there not an opportunity lost in all this retendering for the same companies by and large, <coughs> yeah. where you could well, monitor they're, quality they're differently? not necessarily the same companies, and we do it through public contract Scotland, so it's, it's open and transparent, as we are legally obliged to do. OK. Moving to three years might be sensible, but okay. I will leave it at that, convener. Colin Beattie. Thank you, Mira. Um, enterprise and skill agencies uh, are often a, a subject uh, that this committee looks at, and uh, obviously they're, they're vitally important in delivery down the line of jobs and job quality and so forth. If you had the opportunity to direct them, how would you use their budgets to improve job quality across Scotland? Did I catch you out there? <laughs> well, I, I, I include myself as one of the skills agencies, so I was going to let my colleagues have a <laughs> go first. Who would like to take the question? Helen Martin. Yeah, well, I, I think there's a, there's a very simple answer here, and that's that you consider job quality when you are considering whether or not you fund people to, 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 to take on apprentices or you know, or any other training scheme. Um, right now, I don't feel like there's any assessment of that within um, how this the schemes work. I think, um, you know, people kind of get access to, to public funding to offer uh, apprenticeship schemes without really any kind of consideration of how well they've done previously to support um, people to stay on and work. and. Um, you know the sorts of the the job quality at the, at the end of that either you know we we know that there are frameworks that exist in sectors where the job quality is routinely very very low and there is no consideration of whether or not it is actually appropriate to to be funneling public money in that way or how we can actually incentivize through the use of these contracts um a slightly and, and other forms of public money as well, um, a different way of working. So we see business support going routinely to, to companies that have very, very low out outcomes. I mean, you only have to look at the grants for Amazon. And it was, um, it was, it was positive to hear uh, the First Minister actually talk differently on that just this week. And I think there is a lot more that we can do in that, in that space if we wanted to, that was about ensuring that every bit of public money that we have goes to supporting the type and quality of employment that we want to see in Scotland. Because it is actually legitimate for us to have an interest in what happens in the workplace because so much of um, people's livelihoods and their outcomes um, it depends on what happens within that that sort of working day, and I think for too long we've stood back as sort of um, as as policymakers from having that kind of scrutiny on on the workplace and sort of left it as the domain of business, and they can do whatever they want. So you think that's been an ongoing deficiency in the system? Yeah, absolutely. I think I think for, for we're actually. I'm, I mean, I'm encouraged by some of the things that we're hearing today and some of the approach that's been taken in in the, the work that Scottish government have done in the last few years. But for a very very long time, this was very much a, any job will do. It, it really doesn't matter what type of job. It doesn't matter if you're out on the street again six months later, a year later. Um, you know, there there were very very poor outcomes. I think for people, and it and it has really caused um, 
a distrust, a very large distrust of this type of work among low paid workers because the outcomes have been so poor. Even where people have been finding employment, the outcomes have been quite poor because the, the type of employment hasn't always been um, as good as it should be. Now, there have been other types of employment, as Matt referred to. It's not as if this is the, this is the only outcome that's available. But I think there has been a, a large suite of it that has been a kind of low pay, low quality sort of and then you just sort of revolve into unemployment, into low pay, into unemployment, and it just it, it doesn't help people get the kind of life outcomes that they want. Yeah, I think the um, we would consider um, that um, that it would be important um, as um, a rich government to do um, as much as it can to promote fair fair work and, and decent work, and I think that would that would include through. Um, through various programmes that um, that it funds, I think to sort of pick up on a point um, that was made earlier, um, I think that that needs to go beyond pay. Although payment of the living wage is very important, um, it would include um, and the um, the misuse of zero hours contracts, um, seen through um, through the issues that that CAB clients come in for advice about um, that in an, in many cases. Um, Misuse of zero as contracts has caused hardship, um, it's caused difficulties for people um, enforcing their rights at work. Um, there are other factors, um, whether um, whether people, employers pay people on time, um, whether um, they um, they um, to assert their their sort of basic rights at work, um, and, and various various factors. Um, um, such as those, but I think it's 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 something that um, that sort of government government should be be promoting, and I think that doing that through through the use of some of the programmes it funds is, is a way to do that. I think it goes back to something I said earlier about around responsible businesses and, and, and the nature of that changing in Scotland as well. Um, if, if we're talking here, or this is leading to more conditionality in, in, in business support uh, around quality jobs, I, I think we're already on that path anyway as, as businesses begin to change, begin to value their employers more in, in, in Scotland. And I also think it's no surprise that government's listening to those discussions as well about how do we create fairer, more equal quality jobs in the workplace. Uh, and businesses, I think, are ready to have that discussion, to listen to those re reviews and, and look at the rewards that might take place from that in terms of increased pro productivity. But I think it's an area that we can't just nosedive straight straight into out without a broader conversation with business to understand where, where we're at at this moment in time. I also think we have, also have to look at where Scotland's place is in the global economy in terms of our competitiveness, in terms of our need not to try and deter investment into into businesses in Scotland and, and, and if the business in support potential conditionality does that how do we strike a fine balance in that too so we don't want to discourage business investment we want quality jobs what's the conversation that we need to have without diving straight first into conditionality and business support is, is what I'm trying to put across yeah. <coughs> I mean I think it's a danger to kind of do Broad brushing some of this stuff, the this, this statistics we've got in terms of evidence and evaluation from the apprenticeship programme is somewhat showing a satisfaction level of those that completed of about 86%. These are 2016 figures, and we'll repeat the exercise this year. And uh, four out of five apprentices had were still in employment six months later and could report at least one career progression step within it. So the apprenticeship programme delivers, a we think, a strong return for, for the Scotland's economy and for individuals participating within the programme. If I switch back to the South of Scotland agency, one of the targets for them will be to reach as many of the small to medium-sized companies that are within their, their, their area who, who challenge with rurality and uh, business development. So, again, Obviously, we want the best results and the best commitment to, to fair work, but there's a balance to be struck in terms of where they are in a journey and where you pick them up and where you want to, to uh, take them to. Uh, we've been working with Scottish Funding Council, Scottish Enterprise and Highlands and Islands around the Enterprise and Skills Review. There's been four missions committed from the Strategic Board, and one of those is around productivity, workplace innovation and kind of new business models. 
and we'll work in partnership with, with the agencies around how we implement that and there's strong reference in there to fair work and also to an inclusive growth agenda that government is promoting. I understand, looking at what you're saying, Gordon, about the uh, the positive aspects of someone getting a job and, you know, I realise everybody has to start at the bottom and work their way up, but they have to see a, the opportunity for a clear progression, I would have thought, into a, a decent quality job. I would say a, a, a good number of these jobs are, Helen referenced uh, construction earlier on, a, a lot of the construction frameworks are set at industry rates that are agreed with the trade unions. So it's under like Ian Rogers from the Paint and Decorators, Decorators Federation would probably take exception to, to Helen how they've referred to because Ian drives a high quality agenda. They want the best young people in and they pay you know, in excess, way in excess of what the apprenticeship the pay would be required to be because they want to attract, you know, really suitable and good calibre young people. So we need to look uh, at the, the frameworks and how qualifications are structured. We have developed the Scottish Apprenticeship Advisory Board, heavily populated with employers, and we're asking them to help us progress the agenda, not just around things like fair work, but around the quality and diversity and actually then take ownership of the qualification standards themselves. Just moving that forward a little bit, the committee's recent work on the European structural funds has highlighted a need for increased regional focus to economic development. How would <coughs> enterprise and skills agencies, or how should they use their budgets to address economic disparities between regions of Scotland? come back. Uh, I think we're working and certainly have done a lot of work with Scottish Enterprise around regional partnership and uh, across the three Ayrshire's where we've been working with them on the Ayrshire growth, growth deal. From an SDS perspective what we've tried to do is provide a kind of evidence base and actually understand actually what those anomalies are, where there's challenges, where there's been growth and where there's been certainly a negative growth or, or, or much slower growth, and then commit the resource uh, in behind those those plans. So whether it's around city deals and, and working there, and uh, we've also produced regional skill investment plans which are aligned to uh, city deals and some of the opportunities that they create. So the ones that we've done for Edinburgh and Lothians make great play of the bigger opportunities around data analysis and artificial intelligence. So I think there's a, a range of ways that we can, can, can work with the, the agencies and local authorities. I suppose it's judging the criteria for your investment. It's, it's about safeguarding jobs in a particular region. It's about creating investment. What type of size of businesses are in the area that you want to invest in or, or have in an area to? What's the infrastructure there as well? So I think those questions for a kind of criteria approach is, is probably one where the regional partnership could have impact in, in terms of asking those questions of business and the wider community within those regions. What, uh, what role would you see for local authorities in this? Well, I, I actually think local authorities are key economic development agencies, and I think that role is actually being quite overlooked in, in recent years. I mean, we've seen a real push down in local authority funding, and, and yet at the same time we see sort of business relief rates being prioritised within the previous Scottish budget. And I never could quite understand the, the economic literacy of that. Um, why would we not consider how money enters the area in the round in a much more sort of um, strategic way rather than sort of... Um, saying that we are going to slash the budget to the council, but at the same time we're going to support high streets simply by slashing business rates. And I think the result of that is is quite clear. You know, we've got local local economies that are really, really struggling, and we've got high streets that are dying, and we have a lot of issues around, you know, access to public transport within local areas. The bus networks are, are have really been eroded, and that has an impact on productivity. It has an impact on people's ability to simply get to work, to get to, to get into town and to spend their money, and then they don't even have money in their pocket because their pay's been held down. Uh, local businesses are struggling because the 
the biggest employer in the area, the local authority, that the, those those wages haven't risen. And it, it sort of has this negative cycle. And I think we too often focus on simply one element of the economy, what's happening to you know, large private sector businesses or even what's happening to small businesses, instead of looking at that whole local economy and thinking about how every bit of that budget can work together to support outcomes in that area. So we're quite keen on the idea that this budget should consider more a kind of foundational economy approach, looking at how it is that you keep money in local areas, looking at procurement models like the Preston procurement model um, that, that, that prioritise local spend from the public sector going out and how that actually supported communities in, in the long term. And I think we have far too many examples of small things being done to sort of boost the economy in one way that are completely undermined by another line in the budget in this in the same document. And I think we really need this to step away from that approach. President skills agencies through their budgets and so forth, do they do they actually have a grip of the big picture across the whole of Scotland when we when we're looking at uh, the disparities between the regions? Um I would say probably no, like, I mean, Gordon might disagree with me, but I would say that actually that's a very difficult challenge for an enterprise and skills agency to have because ultimately this is about how different levels of government kind of work together and how the system works in the round. So, I mean, one of the issues that we have in Scotland is around transport and is around our kind of transport network. So we have, you know, roads going north that are really the, like there is no motorway to Aberdeen you know the roads going north are not really fit for purpose the train lines going north are very very poor the investment in the train line is extremely poor as we know you know I can talk all day about the problems with rolling stock and <laughs> various and, and various issues on the on 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 the trains um, we've got issues within our an aging fleet and our ferry services I mean this is the infrastructure of Scotland and this is what gets your products from A to B this is what gets people to their to their work in the morning. I mean, this is the sort of stuff that we need to be really focused on if we're going to see a step change in how our, our economy functions. And yet, it's kind of an aside when we talk about economic development, that kind of, that, that very basic infrastructure. You know, the only bit that's given any real focus from the government is the digital infrastructure, in, in my view. Like, there is a real big programme to push that out. Whereas this other stuff, it feels like we're kind of sticking a, a stick and plaster on what are quite serious problems within within how the economy functions. So, you know, I think there's there are things that need to be looked at in in the round and I just I don't I don't feel like the enterprise agencies can be left to do that on their own or or the expectation that the enterprise agencies correct all of these things on their own doesn't just doesn't really seem viable to me. So who should do it? Well the government. Okay. Right. Um move on to Gordon MacDonald. Thanks very much convener and um just to continue this look at the enterprise agency and skills agency and Colin's view of we should be looking at the big picture, um, there's been a couple of reports this year uh, regarding automation. Uh, we had the Cities Outlook report that suggested 230,000 job losses over the next decade. And with the SCDI report that came out uh, about two months ago, um, which suggests that there was 800,000 jobs potentially at risk in the near future. And I'm just wondering, if you think um, businesses are geared up to face that challenge and what should be the role of um, the enterprise and skills agencies to support them to face that challenge? Yeah, no, yeah happy to cough. Well, we, we're in the middle of a, another industrial revolution. We, we are presently in it. It's not going to happen. It's happening already and it's here. Um, I feel obviously, there's a role for the enterprise and skills uh, agencies to support businesses being fit for the future, not least having the skilled workforce that, that we need to support automation and AI to ensure that we, we've got an economy and a workforce of the future. I also think there's a role around the, the agencies to, whilst we've mentioned, and, and uh, some of these figures can be extreme at times, is how do we create more foreign direct investment into the country and what's the agency's roles in that, I suppose, and look at Scottish Enterprise and SDI and, and, and others in terms of bringing investment into Scotland to develop us as a front runner in the AI digital revolution so we're not left behind. We're at the 
cusp edge of that and jobs are still retained and created certainly a road for sds around retraining support work-based learning is a critical angle and factor in that but i think what's critical to this is the fourth industrial revolution can't be seen in isolation it cuts across every aspect of our society and, and i think we've been calling it from the rooftops <laughs> over recent times about the need for government to introduce a fourth industrial revolution commission to not to look at the negatives but to look at the opportunities that it provides us to create further jobs to have a world-class workforce which we already have but to build on that keep us at the forefront of the world economy and drive that direct investment into scotland and as i said the agencies play a massive role in the investment and reskilling of our workforce to achieve that and just on that point do you think there's um anybody actually within the uk government scottish government or any of the agencies that are looking at this in terms of the manufacturing, because somebody has to manufacture the, the robotics, etc., uh, the sales, the maintenance, etc. I mean, we were in a situation where 30 years ago there was no mobile phone industry, and yet look at the jobs that were created through that. But in order for us to take advantage of that, somebody has to be planning for the future. Is, is that happening? Um, it, it is in pockets. Uh, so, you know, SDS will be looking at, certainly I know they are, and I know Gordon Steam is in particularly from a skills perspective. There'll be pockets of that in Scottish Enterprise. The bits that miss, that's missing is the glue. What, what is it that we want to achieve in, in the fourth industrial revolution? Do you just want to be part of it or do we want to be a front runner? Do you want, how do we realise the opportunities? So things are happening in isolation and great things, not bad things, good things happen across industry public sector and the agency the problem is it's not joined up and it's not pointing to one's particular aim and vision of that we'll be a digitally front-running nation where our people are x y and z and I, i'm making this up as I go along in terms of the objectives of that but that's the key part it needs some kind of commission it needs some kind of <coughs> private public sector agency discussion to bring that aim to a reality and at the moment that's the conversation that isn't happening and if there's some way government can facilitate that I wholeheartedly, uh, wholeheartedly think, well, I know SCDI board and members would support a fourth industrial revolution commission taking place. No. No. Um, well, uh, we also did a report this year with the Scottish Government on automation um, that, uh, th that looked at how automation was already impacting the labour market and we did a, a, a very small survey of uh, members and I find that it, it was having an impact but we were still at early stages there were some sectors where we had started to see um, high numbers of job losses um, banking for example but um, retail for example as well um, but there were the for for most sectors it was in very early stages and um, there, there was maybe more of a question of how jobs were changing rather than how jobs were necessarily being displaced but we do share the kind of concern that this could be um, quite a significant uh, change to the labour market um, going forward, which is why the S2C recently wrote with the CBI um, to the Scottish Government on the issue of um, skills and in-work training and the need to really prepare the, the, the sort of ground for supporting employers um, through a kind of tripartite approach where employers, unions and the government sort of work together to try and make sure that there is um, the the proper kind of framework put around in work training because I think the focus has been um, rightly at the time of the recession very much about youth unemployment and about supporting young people back into work and um, I think the world has kind of moved on and changed a little bit so it's not to say that we want to see any reduction in skills budgets for apprenticeships or anything we absolutely don't but it is to say that we need more of a focus on in work training and we need um, much more of a framework that allows um, employers and workers to kind of drive that change because I think it's very difficult actually for people in SDS to sit within an agency and sort of design a skill system that meets a very changing labour market that's rapidly changing it's very difficult to do that so in some ways the employers and, and workers need to talk about what, what it is that they need in order to support their skills because we have to remember most people who are in work now are going to be the people who are in work tomorrow when the jobs are, are, are are looking different so we do need to think about what, how the, the current workforce um, adapts. Okay, Gordon. Uh, I'll share with the committee a paper that's been done by SDS around uh, what we have deemed as meta skills but we believe it's the type of skill sets that will make a difference 
in an environment that's going to move a hell of a lot quicker than it's moved in the in the past. We've done a significant amount of that. That's not just for SDS, we're socialising that with our uh, partners and stakeholders and asking them to how we can incorporate these skills into the qualification structures and curriculum that we have, and certainly doing work with Education Scotland. And on the enterprise side, the work we're doing there links into things like National Manufacturing Institute for Scotland, and probably that comes closest to what uh, Matt's describing there as a kind of uh, programme of programme of work. So that's not just focusing on the developments that are going to take place in Shinnan, but in a kind of wider operational model. And it's not just purely about that manufacturing, but much more on the, the digital side. You then you've got to look into areas like the innovation centres that have been supported by the Funding Council and things like Data Lab and others. So collectively, and as I said, it's maybe not there as a coherent package, but there's some really stunning work that's going on across, across Scotland and I referenced earlier some of the work in the City Deal from the University of Edinburgh around data and analytics, and that's leading at a UK level. So uh, I wouldn't want to be too dismissive, but in terms of presentation, it probably could be a bit better. And I think there's also a language issue in terms of when you're speaking to companies. A lot of them are not clicking on to Industry 4.0 when you start talking through some of the challenges that they face, what some of their competitors are doing and the kind of penny starts to kind of drop and they, and they make the association. But uh, so there's a language that we need to maybe reflect on in terms of when we're speaking with businesses. We've touched upon conditionality of um, business support, um, but I'm just wondering, should in-work training be part of uh, conditions of receiving public funds? Helen mentioned earlier on, it's been an area where the UK government for the last probably 30 years has been completely kind of hands off in, in, in policy terms. England have dabbled and kind of done bits of work through Chain to Gain and, and, and other things. But I think we see a need for that and certainly the work that we do with industry and uh, with, with businesses. We've got a product called Skills for Growth, which will work with SMEs and maybe for, for kind of three days consultancy support, try and uh, hone in and the priorities for them to, to invest in. But I think across the board, when touch on the demographic profile of the workforce and the need for people to change, then there needs to be more <coughs> development in the workplace. And we also need to make more of you know e-learning and the network of regional colleges that we've got as well is a bit of an untapped uh, potential there. To, to the panel in general, obviously Scottish Government's programme for government uh, mentioned this increased conditionality, but I was just wondering you know, what your view was on that and what should be the key conditions that should be attached to uh, any public funding? Uh, I think I'll have touched on it probably the most <laughs> already in the discussion, so the, what I said previously doesn't, doesn't change. I think this needs a further conversation with business before we, we take that position forward and the nature of business is already changing in, into the fact that people rise empowering their workforce, ensuring that they're getting training, ensuring they're getting the support that they need uh, is, is already happening. Um, whether that's happening across the board, I, I wouldn't like to say, and I, I don't believe I could comment, but I do think it needs a further conversation with business to understand. On the back of that, I do think we need to start looking beyond our shores, though, in terms of already attracting these types of businesses that are already doing this stuff by nature into Scotland to locate, to bring their talent here, to be, support our economy moving forward. And I think as well as putting increased focus on business support, we need to put increased focus on our competitiveness and bringing businesses that are already doing this just as a matter of course. Anybody else want to comment? Mm -hmm. um, I think it's important, I mean, I think one of the good things that was put into the national performance framework um, was a focus on access to training um, for, uh, for workers. And um, I think that was a really important addition to the national performance framework because it is actually a statistic that is, when you look at it, is, is, is going in the wrong direction. Um, so it, I think the measure is around the number of employees that have access to training course within the last six months or the last three months. And it is, A, it's very low, and, and B, it's sort of dropping. And um, we would be very concerned about the fact that you are much, much more likely to have received a training course if you're in already a very high-skilled role. So again, there's this kind of um, disconnect between 
the, the sort of two ends of the labour market that we would be intensely concerned about. So you have sort of high skilled work where, where workers are offered support and they are offered um, the, the chance to update their skills maybe um but then you have the low skilled end of the um, of of the labor market where actually you know employers tend to take a kind of churn approach um the there there doesn't necessarily seem to be that same investment in the labor market investment in skills over the longer term and i think for us part of this conversation needs to be how do we ensure that there is there a there's routes through from low skilled to high skilled jobs, and b that low skilled workers are often are also offered those opportunities because with the changes in technology, I think actually we're much more likely to see that hollowing out of the labour market increase rather than decrease, and we're much more likely to see the sort of outcomes for low skilled workers um, reduce rather than than increase. And, and there is a real danger that there are a group of workers for whom this change is is quite a negative change and and um, and only and only pushes them further down into sort of poverty and 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 kind of bad quality jobs although I don't I don't really I, I think every job can be a good job I think I don't really like to to think of it in those terms but I know that that's the way the discourse often works um, I think to to kind of reiterate the um, some of the earlier points um, made around um, around fair work and using it as an opportunity to drive that forward. Um, it might be possible to um, uh, sort of, is it to wrote some of the um, comes of the, the Fair Work Convention, um, which did a, a sort of an excellent piece of work that, that sort of really got to grips with what, what sort of fair work is in and what fair work actually means um, in Scotland. And I think one of the the points that they've um, that they've emphasised is that um, it's good for employers and business too. Um, so it might be be an opportunity to try and try and link that in with some of the the sort of funding that's that's provided. Thank you. Well, if there are no other questions from committee members, um, may I thank all the panel for coming in today. I'll suspend the session briefly to allow for a changeover of witnesses.
Well, welcome back to um, our session on draft budget scrutiny, and uh, welcome to our second panel of witnesses. Um, we have Kirsty McHugh, Chief Executive of Employment Related Services Association. Welcome to you, and also John Downey, who is the Director of Public Affairs at the Scottish Council for Voluntary Organisations. So, welcome to you as well. Um, and we'll start this session with some questions from John Mason. Uh, thanks very much, convener. And if you were in the previous session, you'll not be surprised uh, that I'm starting on the same uh, subject, which is around the budget. And I mean, our understanding is that uh, previously, when Westminster was in control of uh, this area, the budget was considerably higher. We're now talking about 96 million over uh, three years. And I just wonder if you think uh, that budget is going to be sufficient. And uh, I think it was ERSA actually that said uh, that would target 38,000 workers and, and maybe was suggesting that it should be more than that. So maybe you could give us some comments on that area. Yeah. Uh, quite difficult to compare like with like in terms of um, this budget settlement vis-a-vis -vis what we had before. So um, I think Matt in the previous panel referred to the Cambridge Policy Association as Associates work, which was back in 2012, which at that point found that 660 million was being spent on employability in Scotland, only 12% of which was coming from the DWP. So there's a much wider pot. That's clearly six years ago, so it'd be worth doing that, that work again. Um, the, the Department for Work and Pensions in the, um, the settlement um, cut the money hugely. They did for their own programmes as well. And so the picture now is that they're expecting the majority of job seekers to be supported by Job Centre Plus. And so Fair Start Scotland is a really targeted programme, only supporting 38,000 over the three years. If you look at the 96 million, that's the maximum amount of money which Scottish Government can spend on the programme. But it's a payment by results programme. And so actually not all the 96 million might be spent. So one of the things we've been saying is as the programme goes on, if we think we're looking at underspends, let's take that money and reinvest that in more job seekers. Whether the money is going to be available, uh, going to be enough, you know, and, and there's never enough, I think depends on the intensity of the need of the people who uh, are referred and take up the opportunity to go on to the programme. And then also whether the providers can bring in some additional money around them. Because it's not just about First Art Scotland, it's about what else can be aligned and coordinated. And can I just ask you that? Are you mm. suggesting that there's a real risk, you think, that the 96 million might not be spent? It's a payment by results programme. Yes. It won't, be, it won't be spent. And what we don't want is money disappearing elsewhere. Mm -hmm. So we'd like some assurances. So let's get some early warnings of that and actually pull it back and use it for the job seekers who really, who really need it. A couple of things on the alignment of budgets is um, we do have some concerns. Of, first of all, programmes which are funded by European Social Fund, which is actually the biggest ticket funding stream for employability and skills and sort of anti-poverty work in Scotland. It, it looks like that a lot of local authorities are taking the view that if a job seeker is on First Start Scotland, they then cannot access ESF provision. That was a problem with predecessor programmes. It's proving to be a problem now. The second thing is... What's causing that problem? I think it's interpretation of ESF rules. I, you know, and people are taking different views, but it's a real issue. The other one to flag is ITAs, the individual training accounts. They could be really valuable. But it appears now that if you're on First Start Scotland, you cannot get access to an ITA. That doesn't seem right either. And actually, these are very vulnerable people with quite a lot of needs. So we need to be sort of pulling money in from all over the place to be able to help them. So, Donay, would you like to come in? Yeah, I think so. I mean, I think what Kirsty's saying here is that actually, in a sense, there's not coherence around... The, the budget and how it's spent. The 660 million is spent by a variety of agencies, public, private, third sector. Uh, and actually, what we're doing now, we're not aligning it effectively. That actually takes takes a look at the person, what their needs are, and how we, how we take them forward. Because actually, at the moment, what we've got is you can get a pot of money here to get support, but that cuts you out from this level of support that you might need. So I think. For all of that, there is a different look, and it, and it gets back to your conversation at the end of the previous session about the fourth industrial revolution, if you want to put it on that, and what skills do we need 
to create a fairer and more prosperous Scotland. One, we don't want people to be left behind, which in the Scottish government's got a no one left behind strategy, which we, we, we are totally in support of. But actually, the budget alignment and actually the spending of money doesn't actually match up. So I think there's, there's clearly thought needs much more thought needs to be given about what we're spending in terms of employability, where it's invested, whether it's actually nationally or locally, who is most in need, and we get to the right people. So I think there's a bigger picture in terms of the budget. The 96 million, I think, is set, as Kirsty said, you know, the, that may not all be spent. But that's one of the whole flaws in the Fair Start Scotland programme that was payment by results and not payment by progression. Because actually, people with particularly those furthest from the marketplace, although I hate the phrase, don't go in a linear process to go on to Fair Start, get a job, and I will sustain that job, particularly if they have mental health, alcohol, or drug problems. That is not going to happen. So there is a whole need to rethink how we interlink the programmes, how we interlink the money. Uh, and a bigger picture spend on the budget. I suppose in some sense, I'm not saying the, the 96 million is immaterial, but in the big picture, it needs to fit with what else we're spending. And when Kirsty mentioned European Social Fund, and I sat last year on one of the growth fund panels, which was giving out £150,000 to organisations to help them grow, create jobs, uh, and this was third sector. Now, the problem was we were looking at investing in organisations who were doing employability programmes throughout the country, but actually we couldn't tell, or no one could tell us, was the local authority investing in the same type of programme in that area? Because we didn't want to duplicate. So actually, we don't have enough data to show actually we're spending the money that we're using at the moment effectively. And I think that is a flaw within the system as well, and doesn't make to use the budget limited or not as effectively as we should. So I think there's you know there's lots of bigger issues than just the ninety six million that need to be considered there. Jackie Bailey was asking previously, and I think we're going to get more figures yeah. perhaps from Spice as well as to how the, about the whole programme, because I think that's right. I think the point's been made that uh, we need we need, all need to understand better where all the money is. So that's across employability. I mean you've kind of mentioned other things like health and so on. I mean do you think first start Scotland has any impact on things like housing, childcare, health, and, and these wider issues? Uh, I see you're nodding, Ms McHugh. One of the key things in terms of, you know, getting people into a job is actually having them in a secure housing environment, particularly, you know, ex-offenders. I mean, SEVO, we run our Community Job Scotland programme. Uh, so we are creating 700 jobs a year in the third sector. Now, those jobs are very targeted at people with long-term conditions, ex-offenders, veterans. So it is very much people with hardest to reach. So our members are creating those jobs. But actually, when you've get, got a young person who has got a chaotic lifestyle, they might have come out of prison, it's actually... Creating the job is not the problem. It's all the other issues surrounding them that needs to be thought through. They need support to access benefits, to get some housing. And I remember we had uh, some Scottish government officials were shocked in one of our Q&As on Community Jobs Scotland, where actually one of our members was actually giving a young man £500 uh, deposit to get his, his flat because they consider him to be a volume employee. And actually, there are some areas there where actually some of the budget that we need here, particularly for people furthest from the market who have issues, we need to think about their other needs and how we can support that. There's a third sector trust I was talking to a few months ago, and they gave out about £97,000 a year to young people who are getting their first job through the likes of Fair Start and other programmes who might need driving lessons, they might need, if they're getting a chef's job, knives, they might need a suit to go for an interview. They do it through third sector organisations, but actually that's about supporting the person to actually get that job. Because, it's because the public sector has to be more rigid and the third sector can be more flexible. Is, is that just the way it works or can that be improved on, do you think? I, I think that can be improved upon. I, I, I think the, the public sector can be flexible. We've seen it in, in, in other areas as well. I, I don't think it's third sector's flexible and, and public sector's not flexible. I don't think that's... The, the argument uh, there. So I think, it, but it's about taking those lessons and saying, how can we do it? I know that trust, for example, they initially gave out the money direct to young people, so they had a few issues with where it was spent. So now they do it through organisations. So they learned the lesson of how you actually then say, because actually, particularly housing is critical for 
young people. And, we're, and we've seen that if they want to sustain a job, sustain a tenancy, and actually make that work. Because if you've not got that, then you've not got the security that enables you to go to work every day. OK, Ms McHugh. I think um, First Star Scotland is um, well designed in that it's quite so specific in terms of the levels of service that the Scottish Government um, uh, is, is making sure that the providers um, give the job seekers, but at the same time is quite flexible. And so we know that there are likely to be sort of common needs. It's often about a log lack of job history, sort of confidence or skills needs, etc. Um, but we know that it's also going to be people, there are people on the scheme. Um, with you know, long-term health conditions or they're recovering from drug and alcohol, they've got criminal backgrounds, they've got housing needs. Often, the reason that somebody's not working will be a mix of them. It might be there isn't a bus. You know, so it can be quite practical things. But again, this, the First Star Scotland sort of specification is, is, is pretty good on that. Um, it sets out when childcare costs can be covered, for instance, that, that, that sort of thing. Um, it is about, it's not just about what the providers themselves do though, it's about their partnerships and their knowledge of the other local organisations, many of which are going to be third sector in those localities. What was the issue I wanted to come on to next, which was, you're talking about partnerships, especially with third sector, I have a feeling I know what Mr Downey's going to say on this. Um, do you think there's potential for uh, the third sector to be more involved or how can they be involved? Yeah, I'll go first. Uh, it, it's interesting this when I remember uh, last year we released a, a briefing last May before the contracts were announced for Fair Start Scotland. Uh, the feedback we were getting, I think, from our members was the decision to adopt a single contract within each area has minimised the involvement of small and medium-sized third sector organisations, particularly those who specialise. The procurement process was not sufficient for the formation of, you know, a consortium, the con commission programme was overly complex and inaccessible for many organisations. So actually, that briefing we can happily send to the committee. We sent that to ministers actually before uh, the programme contracts were announced because it was feedback we were getting through the process of the engagement of the third sector. Now, I think that was a real missed opportunity. I'm hopeful that it won't be missed the next time. So I think there, there's huge potential. And so was the third sector not prepared for it? Well, well, what was happening was a lot of small and medium-sized organisations were opting out of the process of actually bidding for any of the contracts right. because, one, the procurement process favoured probably larger organisations. Right. And actually, their concern was not that the private sector would win all the contracts, but actually all the big boys in the third sector. Right. No disrespect so the, to them, because I've, I've got two of them on our, our own board. But right. So likes of an ABLE win, and WISE Group would yeah, be able well, to cope with it? Yeah, they yes. would all be able to cope with it. And the, the Chief Executive of the WISE Group and ABLE Scotland are on our board. So we know the yeah. concerns. Of, but the point was, what I'm saying here is, lots of third sector, small and medium sized mm -hmm. providers were opting out of the processes simply because they found it inaccessible and actually they were going to be left as subcontracts. There. They weren't able to access it. The procurement process actually worked against what Scottish Government were actually aiming to achieve. Now, the aims of Fair Start, the aims of what Scottish Government wants to do in terms of employability, we don't have any issues with. They are hugely ambitious, the principles are right, but the procurement process is actively working against achieving those aims. So maybe we can learn from that for next time. I mean, would you make uh, it more than nine contracts? Is that how you would do it? Well, make them smaller? Well, if we had, the, the, you can still have the nine contract areas, but you can split into smaller contracts. Because actually part of the process here is what we need to do is, yes, you can create partnerships with the larger primes and a subcontracting situation uh, where you get specialist providers. But actually what we want to do is be able to create a level playing field between the big players in the third sector and small and medium-sized players, where actually we can form you know, more groups of consortium, because there's lots of very small organisations and, and medium-sized organisations who are involved in employability, but are very specialised providers. They wouldn't be technically termed employability providers, but they're actually helping people turn their lives around and get them into jobs. And will they jobs. Do not think they'll still be used under the present system, or can they not be used? They, they can be used, and some of them are being used. But the feedback we're getting from some of them is not with all the primes, but some of them feel as if they've been squeezed out right. in, in terms of the subcontracting process. And hopefully what Scottish Government's, you know, talking to them, some of that will come out. Certainly uh, some of the primes, there's great relationships between them and their, and their third sector subcontractors. In other areas, I would say there's issues. Uh, as I say, some people think they've been squeezed out. So, But all of this provides us with Fair Start Scotland 
is what it is at the moment. I think what we need to do is make sure the next stage is different to achieve the ambitions okay. that we all yep. want to see. OK, Mr McHugh, and then that's me finished. Uh, I partly agree with John um, around that, and I was very involved with um, an expert reference group, you know, behind the scenes in, in terms of sort of making sure that we, we, we got this right, because uh, I've seen procurements all over the UK. And what I see again and again is you have great policy intent, and then the commercial processes come in sideways towards the end, and you get a particular outcome. And I've seen it across public services. And there's a couple of things. Um, the procurement was actually very quick. So the amount of time that the providers were given to put in bids was too quick. And we spoke to um, the minister about this. It was about five time. weeks, wasn't it? Something yeah. like that. And actually, we, we, we spoke to the minister, and he, and he did he understood that, and it was slightly extended. Um, but that meant you didn't have the time to put the consortia together, as John is talking about, because that takes longer. Mm -hmm. The second thing is, actually, commercial processes generally don't like consortia. They, they judge them as more risky. And so in the scoring criteria, what you see again and again is consortia are actually um, uh, you know, measured a little bit, little, little bit lower. So inherently, there's something wrong, which means you haven't got a lay, level playing ground, playing field. I don't think, well, I think I, I, I disagree with John, is going down to lots of micro-contracts um, is probably not a good thing. Uh, we have nine at the moment. Let's see how that runs. If you make them too small, um, you lose a lot. You increase costs. Um, in, you know, so it's so. Let's just see how these these go on, and then sort of take a judgment for ne next time round. Okay, that's me. But I think within that, the nine contract, I'm not saying we should shouldn't do that. But actually, this is about the specialisation and the support that those furthest from the marketplace need, and particularly around if you look at the no no one left behind strategy, how actually the people there are going to access. Because a lot of the fear start. I mean, it was in the, the committee's own notes for this discussion about parking and creaming. It, it's actually easy for uh, contractors at all levels to pick people who are not that far from the marketplace, maybe need a boost in terms of their confidence after losing the job, help with a CV and get them a job. But those actually be further problems need much more specialised support. And I think part of that in the process would be they would get that specialist support and then they would move on to, say, Fair Start Scotland, because actually they need to sort say, their lives out or their alcohol or their drug problems before they move on to Fair Start. Yes. And I think you know, we see it quite a lot in terms of Community Jobs Scotland. We work very closely with Project Scotland, and we know, working from them, someone having a volunteering experience before going on to Community Jobs Scotland, it, it makes a huge difference, actually, as does mentoring within that process. So, actually, that volunteering experience helps the young person get ready for Community Jobs Scotland, which is a real job, and you're in there. So, actually, there's, there's different ways we can look at how we structure the fair start within different contracts, but actually it's about, if you're looking at people who are really far from the marketplace, what are their needs are? They might not be ready to step into fair start at the moment, which is aimed to get them a job, which is a great thing, but they might need some help with a programme first. So it's actually, how do we help them on the, the journey that they need to go on? Thanks very much. So, so is, it, is it not more of a sort of uh, a broader perspective in terms of looking at outcomes for individuals? So rather than just taking a point in time and what's happened then, look at their progression and if they're on a path of progression, so to speak, in terms of their employment or employment prospects. I think I'm to I totally agree. I mean, we use we use a phrase which I, I, sure, I don't like that much either. You know, take a pe person-centred approach. You look at the person, make a, an assessment of their needs at a point they come into contact with the public sector. So you've got a young person who perhaps is an ex-offender, is out of prison. There's a bit of housing stuff to be sorted out. He might have other problems. What, what does he need to do next? Is it a volunteering programme? Is it something else? And then does it go into a job programme? Because we can actually, we can design that. So I think we need much more at the beginning to actually be assessing and making sure we understand what a person's needs are, and particularly in the light of, you know, a moving economy and what skills people need. I mean, we talk a lot at the moment. We, we young people are all digital natives. Well, they're digital natives on smartphones. They're not actually digital natives for the needs of business or the third sector when they move into a job there, because actually that they, they don't have the skills that businesses need. So there's a whole range of different things we should be looking at how we see people. And actually, I think I think to be honest, that's what Scottish government through uh, Fair Start and their overall aims in terms of employability do want to achieve. And I, I understand the difficulties they had with Fair Start, but... Sir, if I might, might just 
um, come back to you on that, and perhaps Ms. McHugh will have comment on it as well. I suppose part of the difficulty is assessing the effectiveness of any program. I mean, how do you do that if you're not looking at snapshots in time or specific outcomes at specific points in time? How, how do you marry the two together or fit the two together? Can I just want to make clear? First Star Scotland is actually for people who are quite a long way from the labour market. But they are um, assessed as being having a fighting chance of being able to get into work within a year. If they don't fit that criteria, actually, they, they don't get through the door. They don't get referred by Job Centre Plus or, or uh, another referral agency. Um, so actually, what we shouldn't have is um, you know, people who have got the sort of... Um, uh, you, you know, actually are very close to the labour market and are able to get into work of their own accord. So I think we have to be very clear about that in terms of any concern about parking and creaming. It's only 38,000 and it's really targeted at, th at those people. Um, Gordon MacDonald. I had a very quick question, just a bit of clarification I was looking for. Um, we talked about who the successful bidders were. Uh, for the contracts for the, in the nine areas, but the actual providers are predominantly third sector uh, and public sector, and in one area where the third sector aren't involved in delivering that um, in the contract, it's uh, predominantly the public sector that's doing it. Yeah. So I was just wondering, what would have been the difference if the bidders had all been third sector successful? Bidders would have been third sector. What would have been the difference in providing so, that? Gordon, are you looking at what Scottish government uh, have provided so far on their what they're well, actually saying the, the subcontractors are? Yeah, exactly. What, what I'm looking at, for instance, West, um, the successful bidder was a third sector organisation, the Wise Group. Yep. And then of the one, two, three, four, five third sector uh, delivery partners, only one is in the private sector. Yeah, that, that's, you know, I think in, in some areas that is working quite well. In other areas, actually, a, a number of third sector organisations who were initially on some of the primes, the private sector primes, uh, subcontracting lists are not taking up those opportunities. They are not. So actually, what we need to see, uh, and, and we'll be due the figures quite soon, I would think, actually, what the reality is in terms of uh, who's providing all those services and actually how long it will be sustainable as well you know that is an, another issue i mean that's i'm sure that that list you know gives a, a, a great picture of the third sector uh, provision within it but i think we have to wait and see on some of that because certainly some of the feedback we've had not from all the areas so i think it's it depends on who the who the prime is and what those relationships they have i mean for example people plus won the contract in glasgow they have no infrastructure in Glasgow. One, how did they win the contract in the first place when the Wise Group won West and they have, uh, you know, uh, a really strong infrastructure in Glasgow? We're just throwing that in there in terms of... So, Pool Plus were starting from a, a, you know, a wee position behind other people in terms of their infrastructure, their relationships with the third sector. How you, and, and actually, as we talked about, partnerships, subcontracting, consortium, takes time to build those relationships. And actually, so... It'll be interesting to see as we progress on that, how it's going to work. And I, and I think it'll be a bit of a movable feast. I wouldn't make any judgments yet, negative or positive. I'm not, because uh, I know in some areas, the prime contractors and the third sector partners are, are working brilliantly together. In other areas, we're hearing other things, but we're feeding that into Scottish government as we go forward, we will be. We just want the best providers to, to, you know, regardless of sector. We're completely sector blind in relation to that, and you know, we, we have all in have all in membership. I think one thing though that does affect third sector organisations is nervousness about a payment by results contract, and sometimes they don't have the ability to do the financial modelling. Um, but, but that's not just so third sector organisations; that's smaller organisations. So a private sector small organisation might be in the same same issue. But we do find some situations where trustees decide not to get involved because they just don't like the level of risk involved. And that's sort of inherent if you go down any level of payment by results contracts. Where First, First Star Scotland is better than predecessors is the fact that um, it's a more benign payment by results set up. Uh, and there's a 30% service fee. For the end of the predecessor programmes, it was all payment by results, which is a really hard thing to cope with. Colin Beattie, I think you wanted to come in on that point. Yes, the payment by results. Um, 
we've talked about it a fair bit. I'd like more about your views on it and the appropriateness of it. And what would the alternatives be to having that in place? And just to ask a third question in there, um, is there evidence that skews provider behaviour towards parking and creaming? So payment by, re payment by results, I think there's a lot of experience now within this sector of being able to deal with payment by results contracts. And that wasn't the case when I took up this position eight years ago. So I think there's been a huge learning curve over that period. I think the evidence shows that for people who are, have got very intense needs, um, having too much of a focus on um, the result um, is wrong. You know, you have to have more of the, the money coming up front. But it's not just about the payment for individual, you know, job seekers. It's the, about the amount of money going into the pot for that provider overall. And I think the concern is, as I said earlier, about providers being able to do the modelling and being, to, being able to deal with the risk. And particularly for subcontractors, that the prime contractor can have different payment terms so you can have a specialist as part of your subcontracting arrangements who you don't put in a PBR contract. You could just pay them all up front. So there's a potential to do that within this as well. I, I think that it's, in, in some areas, in some approaches it works, but I think actually what we need is a kind of mixed model here. Yeah, we do want to pay people uh, for the results and getting someone into a job, but I think... For us, the, the journey to employment is not that straightforward for a, for a lot of people. So actually what we need to think about is, yeah, and I understand where, as it was Kirsty saying about Fair Start and the people it's targeting, and, and we can go from there. But if we're looking at what we're trying to do here overall in employability, we need to be looking at people's progression and how do we measure that and how do we pay people for it. And I think, I mean, I'm sure every MSP uh, understands the... You know, the financial position that most of the third sector uh, find themselves in in terms of their funding. You know, one year funding, three years is an exception. So that actually works against third sector organisations and actually taking that that risk in terms of that, particularly around the, the procurement process. I was talking, you know, funding was a, it was a big issue. The 30% is better than previously, but actually what we need to be thinking about there is how do we work, you know, a, you know, a model of payment that actually gets... There's a there's a outcome percentage of it, but actually we're we're measuring people's progression and on that and that, and actually that is the key to it. And there's you know there's been very successful programs in different areas. I remember Oxfam ran a program in Manchester. It was very much payment by progression aimed at you know particularly a particular group. Uh, so there's there's different models we can think about in terms of how we use that. So actually then we say. You get someone off drugs and alcohol and you get them job ready as part of a specialist provider's role with it working with, an, with another employment provider, then that is a payment there. Then the employment provider is maybe getting paid for getting them into a job. So there's different ways we can do things, but actually we've got a really straightforward model here that actually is not taking into to consideration the journey and the progression that people are making. How practical is it to have such a... Uh, individual model because the, the the thing about payment by result is obviously it's one size fits all you know the, it, there is a there is a distinct point at which payments fall due what's what uh what the nice seems to be saying is that it should be tailored to in individual circumstances and to the progression of that individual towards the final the final goal how practical is that on a national basis Programs run like that, um, where there have been payment, for instance, you've helped somebody in terms of their, their finances or they've achieved sort of, um, uh, stable housing. And so you can pull together a model like that. Um, you know, the, 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 it's, the Scottish Government has, has, has choices. You know, how much focus do they want to put on work and sustained work as the outcome vis-a-vis -vis other things? And these are political choices, you know, at the end of the day. However, the amount of money available is also um, a concern, you know. And so do you, if you focus um, at, on those progression outcomes, do you then disincentivise people from doing more of the work type bit? You know, because actually there's only a finite amount of money in this particular, particular pot. But I think if, you, if we're looking at the overall pot, we are spending £660 million, as Kirsty said. We were in 2012. Well, 2012. I, bet we, I bet it's less now. Probably slightly less, but it's still around... I suspect around 600 million 
that is that is a lot of money in anyone's terms. So actually, one what we need to do first of all is make sure we, we can actually get the right data so we know what local authorities are investing in employability programmes. Scottish Government's investing, other agencies are investing, so we can actually see where it's been invested, what they're doing with it, so we're not duplicating. And I think part of the, the lack is, and I, I refer to that ESF programme we were talking about earlier on, when we were giving out money for programmes, we were asking the representative from Slater, so I know there was supposed to be one there today, can actually you tell us which local authorities are really investing in these types of programmes? And they can't because they don't have the data. But if we, and I know Scottish Government is trying to address that issue in terms of a more joined up approach. So at a national level, we know what we're spending. How does it relate to a local level? And actually, how can we integrate and align spending on that? And if we had that data, actually, a payment price progression model would be much easier. But actually, a one size fits all model, as we've seen from UK government programmes, you know, have, it hasn't really worked in the past. So we need a much more sophisticated model. Now, that might take five years to move towards that, but I, I, I think that's, that seems to be the way the Scottish Government, for me, in talking to them, want to go in terms of much more person-centred, personalised, and actually so that no one is left behind in the marketplace of the future. Because actually, that change in marketplace that we talked about in terms of the job squeeze, the skills you need, is actually it's much more important that we get people in. And actually, I think it's thinking about the outcomes as well. Because actually, we have an issue. We think actually, if someone goes through a jobs programme, where even in fair start, yeah, you want to get someone into sustained employment. But actually, what if you couldn't at that point, you could get them into a, a really strong volunteering opportunity, which would probably get them a job in the future. I think that's a really positive outcome. So I think, I think our thinking over the next 18 months needs to get a bit more sophisticated to make sure the next stage of Fair Start Scotland builds on where we are from here. And I, and I think it, it, government to us seem to be up for that debate, but I think it, it's something we need to have with the private sector, the public sector and the third sector uh, engaging in that. A common theme seems to be uh, an emphasis on joined up. And just on a slightly different angle there, if you're looking at Fair Start Scotland, and the previous transitional programmes, how well are Job Centre Plus and the devolved services working together? <laughs> okay, the official answer is it's too early to say. Um, you know, the big difference, of course, between um, these programmes and the, the DWP run ones is, of course, Scottish Government Job Centre Plus. Um, but actually, even in England, um, you know, it, they don't always work as happily together as they, as they might do. So work coaches, um, the people within Job Centre Plus who are sort of seeing the job seekers and assessing whether they're, uh, you know, ready to go on sort of um, first up Scotland or whatever else it might be, have got huge numbers of pressures on them, not least the rollout of universal credit. Mm. And, um, you know, and so the concern is a new programme gets introduced and it takes them quite a long while to understand what it is, what the eligibility criteria are, and the main issue that... I could have told you two years ago, three years ago, still in my mind now, is getting the right number of referrals through and actually the, the right people through. And that's what you as a committee, I think, um, should focus on. Um, you know, because that's, that's where this always goes wrong. Yeah. I think, I think that's a Kirsty's point there at the end. Just to make the point is, the number of referrals organisations get will be a critical measure within, within this whole thing. I, I think it's an interesting one. I think... Uh, the relationship over the last couple of years with, I think, the Scottish Government employability and, and, and Job Centre Plus in Scotland, you know, has moved forward, has improved, and certainly discussions we've had, they seem to be working closer together. It's it's one of these things. I I, I know from from our point of view, SCVOs Community Job Scotland, we had we we got a second D from Job Centre Plus in to help us. So actually, that made a huge difference because they had the relationships with the job centres. So actually, try to place people and get people referred through. You know, made it hugely easier for us. So, I think there is much closer working. Uh, how successful that is? Yeah, I think it's really hard to judge. But to be honest, we'll see by the time we get to the end of fair start how it's working. But I think, as Kirsty said, the referrals through, which have always been problematic in some areas, Glasgow, for particular, had some some issues in the past. We will see how that that works. But I think we're at a very early stage. One thing to bear in mind, mind, which is interesting, is the First Star Scotland, of course, is completely voluntary, which is good, completely back that. 
But some job seekers, because they're being referred from Job Centre Plus, think, oh, it must be mandatory. You know, because they just take for granted it's mandatory. And then they'll go along and they'll, they'll meet the First Start Scotland provider, at which point they realise it's voluntary and they might not want to engage. So there's something um, about um, you know, Job Centre Plus having the right information to be able to do like the sale as it was, the seller as, you know, of First Start Scotland, to make sure that people really know what they're um, signing up for um, before they're actually getting to the First Start Scotland provider. The alternative is the First Start Scotland provider goes into the job centre. Um, but at the moment, we have some job centres who are open to that and other job centres are saying, oh no, you can't come through our doors. Uh, you know, so it's but it's very early days, so we're hope, hopeful that will get better. To be pedantic, we were talking about the right people. Can you define the right people? The people who meet the criteria for the specification. What we don't want is um, people being referred to First Start Scotland who are seven months pregnant, um, you know, or, you know, just about to go into hospital because they're going to have an operation, that sort of thing. Jackie Bailey. Yeah, um, most of my areas have been covered, but, but let me come back to procurement because that's raised its head on a number of responses um, and we've talked particularly about Fair Start Scotland. Um, what is your view about procurement in relation to the Employability Fund? Are many of the your members involved in that? Do they appreciate the one-year contracts? rather than the three, not that I want to lead you in a direction, um, rather than the three from Fair Start Scotland. Um, I would be interested in your view. I, I think it, it's interesting. I think uh, I was at the Procurex conference last year and uh, you know, the finance minister was standing up saying we've got you know, world-class procurement uh, uh, service in Scotland and everybody's looking to see it. And actually, uh, technically, that may be true. You know, the processes are all good, but actually it's not delivering the outcomes that ministers want, and I think that realisation is there. Having spoken to the new cabinet secretary for the economy and finance when he, when he got his new job, procurement came up very strongly. And I think it was a Unison Scotland released some figures a few months ago by the number of contracts SMEs were getting in Scotland. So I think, again, I think in terms of the overall procurement processes, it's working against, I think, what the outcome that ministers want in terms of whether it's the economy or whether it's creating jobs or elsewhere, because actually it, it's usually focused on the technical, the bureaucratic and the, the inputs and the processes. And I think there's a bit of change. There's some innovation within the system, the, the subtech stuff that's, that's going on. There's some, some more interesting stuff. But actually, I think in Fair Start Scotland, you know, there was a lot of input from the sector. There was an advisory committee and others. Uh, and those people on there did a great job of putting the third sector perspective. There was a lot of listening. There was a lot of consulting, but not listening. And actually, when you looked at the way the process went, now I understand the timescales and the difficulties, uh, and hopefully we'll improve that for the next time. But I think we still have issues around procurement and commissioning. It, it was referred to in your last session about fair work. The Fair Work Convention has got a subgroup at the moment looking at fair work in social care which is a hugely problematic area, and it's an area where the turnover of staff and the, the whole contract and commissioning issue is, again, hugely problematic. Uh, you know, I know from seeing the draft introduction that one of the recommendations there will probably be that actually, you know, frameworks and commissioning and social care just don't work. We need to change the dynamic on it and how we look at awarding those contracts and actually what the type of care we want to provide for people. So I think... Ministers, I think, should be looking at the overall procurement system. Is that delivering what they want? Because, again, we are... I think it's £10 billion a year has been procured through various systems. Are we getting the, the best value of that? Is it delivering the outcomes that Fair Start intends and others? And, actually, to answer the question, yeah, one-year contracts, we want to move... And there has been a lot of movement, I have to say, in terms of from different funding models from Scottish Government, you know, particularly on the equality side and others, to go to three-year funding. And I, I think that trend will continue from Minister. Yeah, I know you're smiling, Jackie, but I think that there's a, there's a definite commitment to do that. So, and we're, we're working on different funding models with them. So I think that will come sooner rather than later. Thank you. 
There's a review of the employability fund at the moment. Um, generally, one-year contracts are hard to deal with. You know, people want certainty. That said, I'm conscious that you know the, gov the Scottish government might move to three-year contracts, and some of my members might have preferred the one-year ones if they didn't weren't successful. Um, you know, but we do have to look at that broader amount of money, as John says, and how it fits together. And so, the review of the employability fund, I think, is a real opportunity um, to, to make sure we're, we're using that money as best as possible. Okay. Thank you, convener. Thank you. And Gordon MacDonald. Thanks very much, uh, Convener. Um, Fair Start Scotland, there was a comment earlier on that it was well designed and flexible. And we had the transitional programmes prior to that. And I'm just wondering uh, how important were those transitional programmes and what were the lessons learned from them? So we had two, as you mentioned, as I mentioned earlier, WorkAble um, and WorkFirst, which was sort of a continuation of Work Choice, a disability programme. I think they were really, really helpful for Scottish government officials because I was really conscious and I was quite close to them. It's the first time they'd done this, you know, and so actually having the transitional sort of run at it um, was helpful. The other thing, of course, is that we didn't want to gap. Um, between provisions or the end of the, the DWP ones um, and because you need to keep the capacity in the market because it's about keeping your frontline staff actually because if you lose them um, you, you, you lose everything um, so I think they were really important they, they, were, they were pretty small you know they weren't going to change the world in a in a huge way because of the numbers but it did flag up um some of the issues um so for instance in glasgow it, it felt like the um, transitional programs were competing with um some of the glasgow council run um schemes and so how the compatibility came through really clearly about that and as an expert group we were getting live lessons from those transitional schemes which were feeding into thinking about design I think we um, that the focus on service standards, which comes through in First Start Scotland, was another sort of learning point. Mm. Um, John, you want to come on? Yeah, I, th I think in some senses I, I probably see First Start Scotland as a bit of a transitional programme in a sense, because it's Kirsty said true. because because it, it is actually yeah. the first time yeah. Scottish government's had to do this, and I think you know our conversation with senior officials around it is actually. I'm doing more research into wider employability, particularly the user experience, you know, the streamlining of funding as well, the conversion of actually how you allocate the funding is really important, more localised decision making, because I think that's important in terms of people's needs. And actually, I think they're very conscious now of the overall collective impact of all of this. So I think the conversations we've had and actually wider review, think talk to providers, participants, is actually, is all beginning now to happen. So. That is a great thing because actually what's happening is we will see this as a transition and we can make it better the next time and actually it will help improve the wider amount of money we're spending on employability overall. So I think this whole the process at the moment is going to take time, but actually you can see that actually we're thinking in the right direction at the moment, but it is going to take a bit of time. So I think I'm kind of looking on fear start as a, a transition and, and things will get better. <laughs> As you said, it's very early days and, you know, Fair Start Scotland might well be a transition programme. But how would you um, measure success of the programme? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Number of people who uh, you know, actually start the programme and maintain on programme rather than dropping out. Um, the number of people who are, you know, obviously we've got the things about job outcomes, sustained work, that's absolutely true. The number of employers engaged, I think, is really important. The reputation of the programme overall. And so Job Centre Plus and the other referral agencies think this is a great provision and they really want to fight to get their, their clients on it. Um, and then there'll be all the, the other things which the evaluation will pick up, but we won't see in the hard statistics along the lines of somebody able to manage their health condition better or their unstable housing, that sort of thing. Yeah, I think I would agree with that. And I think, you know, the, it'll be interesting to see, I think, as we talked about referrals earlier on, and actually the, also the types of services that are being commissioned in different areas in terms of what people's needs are. I know, as Kirsty said, the people in this are supposed to be relatively close, you know, not always totally close to the market, but have some issues. And actually, while our services are being commissioned by the primes to provide the support that they need, uh, and actually, I think, what is the role, how is the role in programme of engagement with participants and 
employers and providers actually helping to change the dynamic as we go along. I think that will be an important lesson for them, particularly for the next time. How can we use that to be more flexible as we go forward? So we're changing as we go forward and tweaking rather than actually saying, yeah. we'll wait to the end of three years, yeah. do an evaluation. Yeah. You know, that ongoing yeah. learning will be really important for it. Okay. Right. Thanks very much. Thank you. Uh, Jamie Halker johnson Thank you very much. Um, a lot of the areas I was going to cover have also been covered as well. But um, ju just to, to, to talk about um, uh, briefly the, um, the voluntary nature of the um, of the schemes. Um, what happens to those clients that refuse to um, engage with First Start Scotland? program so if you have the conversation with job center plus as a major referral agency and you say i don't really want to do that that's absolutely fine it's voluntary the concern is for those people who you know get some information from job center plus <coughs> go along to the first start scotland provider at which point the penny drops that, that it is voluntary and actually it's a year-long you know scheme and the level of commitment is relatively high and i think oh goodness this isn't for me um, maybe because they do have an operation pending or because of other sort of family reasons. The problem there is that they then start, they, they, they then count as a referral. And then they're not able to be re-referred um, maybe a year on when their circumstances change. I think that's a flaw in the programme design. But, but, but say they choose not to get involved with, engage with the scheme or... Um... Um, you, you know, they go onto the scheme and they do they do job. What is the option for them after that? Job Centre Plus and anything else the Job Centre Plus might want to refer them to. It's just that. Yeah. But you know what there isn't is the ability, you know, a year on, for them to say actually I'm ready for it now. So they will be excluded from that scheme yes. for a period or for for, 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 for good? forever unless unless you've got this is there's a health condition issue. Um, you, you know, I think there's, well, there's, there's, some, there's some things about health and disabilities. You have to check this. We're actually you may be able to. Uh, you know, rejoin, but for the bulk, you've only really got the one chance. Okay, so it's literally a kind of one go, and that's mm, it. Yes. Okay. Um, j just a, not not quite on the same subject, but um, you you've mentioned obviously the figure. This is this is a, a scheme aimed at thirty eight thousand uh, people. Um, is that the the, the maximum uh, you know number of people out there that that would fit into that criteria, or how many people would fit into that criteria? A much larger number. Okay, and what what kind of number? Goodness. So, you know, you, you've got the disability employment gap. Mm -hmm. um, I think yeah. um, the STUC sort of mentioned, mentioned that earlier on. You know, they, they, you know, a lot of those would be within scope mm -hmm. of this particular programme. You, you know, so that, that it's... Goodness, do you have an idea, John? It'd be high. It's, yeah. Much it, larger. It's much larger. And I think the disability gap, I think, you know, Scottish Government are currently looking for ideas of how we, we, we deal with that as, as a separate issue as well, you know, because it actually is a, is a, is a difficult area, simply because it's actually getting the right, the right level of support that employers need to take someone on. Once, it, once someone's in, as they say, was in a job, actually employers absolutely want to keep them because actually they're usually really good, but actually it's making the right level of support. So it's that additionality that some people need in terms of that area, which makes it slightly yeah. difficult for problematic... I think it's, it's one of those things, because if we've looked at the wider employability issue, I think uh, certainly looking at it, you know, if you look at, say, Job Centre Plus, what they're offering is, I mean, if you're over a certain age, they weren't offering you any support at all. And I think what we need to be looking at within what people need and actually the labour market is what support we can offer people at different areas, whether, let's say, they've been made redundant six months ago or they've been out of work for three or four years because of a health issue. And actually, I think that's where the better assessment of need and actually what under better understanding the labour market, where can we point people in jobs to? We all know, for example, that care is going to be is, is increasingly a, you know, a huge area in Scotland. It's going to create more jobs. A lot, it's got high turnover at the moment, given the nature of the pay and the nature of the job and the contracts that organisations have. So we can look at where we can create different jobs, but actually, what are we going to do to get those people into those jobs and make them job ready, the employers want to take them on? And I think that part needs to be a wider, holistic look at the employability agenda. Mm. One lesson from uh, Workable, actually, last year, um, was that referrals weren't coming through and we dug around a bit and um, some, some job centres, um, because they've got new freedoms and flexibilities, were only seeing people on employment and support allowance twice a year. So they weren't actually seeing them to be able to have the conversation about this new provision which had become available. Now that's an issue. 
Um, thank you for that. Uh, interesting. I was actually visited my local DWP on Friday, and one of the issues that they were talking about was care and the shortage of carers and how to, to get more people involved. Um, can I jump onto another <laughs> very quick subject as well? Um, you talked about the relationship between the prime and the co the the, the um, uh, the delivery partners or the subcontractors. Um, there are some at the moment where those relationships are, uh, are less difficult or not quite there. Are there any where those have completely broken down? I don't think so. so. Yeah, I mean, I think it's obviously there's a conversation with the prime and the subcontractors about uh, what you want to do, how much you're going to pay them. Uh, and obviously some people might feel they've been squeezing the margins on that and, and some people have said that to us but then obviously you've got an option whether you want to take those contracts or not engage with the prime as some have done and say well we're going to opt out we are on your subcontracting list but we don't like the look of that that's, that's a choice people make but I think uh, we need to be careful not losing really good specialised providers but I think a lot of that will come out once we see the referrals, what systems, uh, what's being commissioned, and actually the actual list at the end of the first quarter of who the primes are yeah. using. I would be more concerned about the referrals not going through to First Start Scotland as sufficient numbers, because that will hurt the subcontractors yeah. really very much. Because if they're smaller, yeah. they're quite vulnerable there. Do we know of any cases where some, some of the subcontractors have, say, stopped putting themselves forward for those contracts? The only one, so the Scottish Association of Mental Health. Um, you know, decided not to be part of this. And there's, there's an issue here, going back to the very first question, about the money available for something called individual placement support, which is a, a, a very well-evidenced mental health intervention, which integrates mental health support and employability support. It's expensive. Yeah. Um, SAMH are an expert in relation to that. It is probably not affordable on this programme. The Minister wants to see it. Um, across the whole of Fair Start Scotland, but I don't know how the providers are going to do that. And that was an issue of the, 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 the funding and perhaps the funding needing to be provided by the, 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 the contractor you know, up front? Or? The, you know, the, the figures I, I have seen quoted in terms of doing proper IPS, individual placement of support, at the, at the um, fidelity levels are about £20,000 a place. Yeah. yeah. You know. Okay. I, so, I think the interesting thing on this that certainly. A lot of organisations, whether it's Prime and subcontractors, have been very open with Scottish Government in terms of being transparent and actually saying, here are our costs, here are the figures, yeah. here's what we can do stuff for. Mm -hmm. So actually, I think they are yeah. getting a more realistic view of the potential costs yeah. for the future, what that actually means and what it costs to help someone yeah, with mental they, health problems. They do open book accounting. Yeah. yeah mm. So there's, there's much more transparency mm. privately within the system. Okay. Thank you. Right, well, thank you very much to both of our witnesses. I'll suspend for 30 <laughs> seconds while the Minister comes in to deal with the next item of business. The, the committee will now move on to item three on the agenda. Um, may I welcome Jamie Hepburn, Minister for Business, Fair Work and Skills, who is accompanied by Victoria Morton, lawyer from the Legal Directorate, Constitutional and Civil Law for the Scottish Government, and also Richard Dennis, who is the Chief Executive for the Accountant in Bankruptcy. Um, we are now looking at the Debt Arrangement Scheme Scotland Amendment Regulations 2018. So I'll invite the Minister to make his opening statement on the instrument. Thank you very much. Uh, convener, can I begin by thanking uh, you and the Committee for taking time to consider these regulations. They aim to make a, a small uh, number of, of important changes to the Debt Arrangement Scheme, providing greater flexibility and accessibility to the programme. Uh, debt Arrangement Scheme is something I believe we should be proud of. As a first of this type of scheme in the UK and a highly successful debt repayment programme, 
uh, providing protection to those wishing to repay their debt but need more time to do so. It's an important mechanism in helping those who find themselves in difficulty with debt. Over 6,000 people have used the scheme to pay off their debts, helping them from having to either become bankrupt or into, enter into a protected trust deed. It's also allowed a substantial return to creditors with almost £200 million having been repaid since 2011. Uh, the proposed changes reflect feedback received in consultation with stakeholders about how to enable more people to benefit from the scheme. In particular, uh, they reflect a request from the money advice sector to increase the scheme's flexibility. I, I share their view that the change proposed will allow more people to successfully complete repayment programmes. If I may convene, I'll briefly highlight the, the two most substantial uh, changes. The first is to remove the requirement to contribute the full surplus income a person has as part of any debt arrangement scheme. Uh, this is to allow debtors a, a better chance to deal with any unexpected events that they may face. Creditors may I have to wait uh, longer to be repaid in some cases, but I believe it is in their interest to see debts repaid in full through a successful debt uh, payment programme rather than written off through bankruptcy. Uh, stakeholder feedback has also led to the proposal to allow housing debt to be excluded from proposed debt payment programmes. In the majority of cases, the, the right choice will still be for all debts to be included, but the scheme can only work where it offers the debtor protection from enforcement action. And I take the view that the mandatory inclusion of housing debt could, in some circumstances, pose a threat to individuals' housing status. This is something that we clearly want to avoid, but there's also a concern that this possibility may have put some people off signing up for the debt arrangement scheme who could otherwise have benefited from it. We're also using the opportunity provided by these regulations to make a, a number of other improvements which are likely to affect only a, a very small number of cases, but given the regulations give us the opportunity to make such improvements, I think we should take at that opportunity. For example, Regulation 10 modernises the, the legislative language to reflect changes in the law around same-sex marriage, whilst Regulation 4 extends the powers of a debt arrangement scheme's administrator to fix accidental errors to reflect experience gained in running the scheme. Regulation 16 extends the circumstances in which, circumstances in which the debtor may apply for a payment break as a result of a fallen income to include cases where that income comes from benefits. In response to it being highlighted during the consultation process, Regulation 6 creates a sensitivity clause to afford vulnerable applicants the same level of protection when entering an insolvency solution, so that where appropriate, those confirmed as being at risk may have their address details withheld from the debt arrangement scheme register. It can be that these regulations provide the opportunity, I believe, to significantly enhance a, a highly successful programme, and they have received widespread support from across the sector. I hope I can rely on the support of the committee, but will, of course, be happy to take any questions you may have for myself or for Dr Dennis and Ms Morton. Thank you, Minister. Uh, does any committee member have any questions on this? Um, no. Uh, therefore, in that case, we'll simply move to agenda item four, and uh, we move to the formal debate on the motion to approve the affirmative instrument. And I would invite the Minister to formally move the motion. It moved, convener. Does anyone wish, wish to speak on the matter at this stage? In that case, I'll simply put the question. The question is that motion S5M13670 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. yes. We're agreed. Right. Thank you um, very much for com coming in. I think uh, the only item for the committee to agree then on this point is uh, that um, I, as convener and the clerk, will simply produce a short factual report of the committee's decision and arrange for it to be published. Are we agreed on that? Yes. Right. Thank you very much. Thank you. And I'll suspend the meeting and now move to private session.